Today's episode marks the first in a series with Dr. Andy Galpin. Dr. Andy Galpin is a professor of kinesiology at Cal State University, Fullerton, and one of the foremost world experts on the science and application of methods to increase strength, speed, endurance, hypertrophy, and various other aspects of fitness, exercise, and sports performance. People generally have two major goals in mind. Goal number one is achieving some sort of appearance, right? This is, uh, I want to be big or I want to not be too big or I want to be lean, something, right? It doesn't matter what that goal is, but there is an aesthetic component to almost everybody. They want to look a certain way or not look a certain way. The other one is functionality. So I want to be able to perform a certain way. Now, again, that definition differs per person. So I want to be better at strength. I want to be better at mobility. So there's some sort of appeal to aesthetic and there's some sort of appeal to functionality. So within both of those categories, we want to understand where do I need to go with my exercise training so that I can be as fit and as healthy and achieve these goals that I want now, as well as be in a position where I can maintain them for a long period of time. So then the question kind of comes back to saying, well, how do I know which area I need to focus on the most? And why am I not achieving these goals or how can I get there more effectively? So the saying we actually use here a lot is the methods are many, but the concepts are few. There are many reasons why one should exercise and we could perhaps cover that later in our chats. But the physiological adaptations can be bucketed really into nine areas. So the very first one is what I call skill or technique. So just learning to move better, more efficiently, with a specific position and timing and sequence or whatever that is, this could be running more effectively. This could be practicing a skill like shooting a, a ball, anything like that. I call that skill development. The second one is speed. So this is simply moving at a higher velocity or with a better rate of acceleration. Okay. Um, that's very similar to the next one, which is power and power is speed multiplied by force. Um, the next one then, of course, on top of that is force or strength. So that, those are really synonymous terms, right? Uh, how effectively can you move something? Now, this is often confused, strength rather, uh, as muscular endurance. What's the maximum thing you can move or it's the maximum amount of force you can produce one time? It's not how many repetitions in a row you can do. That's actually another one of our adaptations called muscular endurance. All right, so that is typically under the order of like, say five to 25, maybe 50 repetitions. Think of a classic, how many push-ups can you do in a row? How many sit-ups can you do in a minute? Like things like that are muscular endurance. Muscular endurance tends to be localized. So this is you know specific to just say your triceps and your, and your deltoids. It's not a overall cardiovascular endurance marker or anything like that. So that's strength, number four. Number five is muscle hypertrophy. And this is the first time now we're talking about uh, an appearance rather than a functional outcome. So, you know, moving better, moving faster, moving heavier are uh, indicators of how well you can move. This is the first one that's just simply how big is your muscle? And that's muscle hypertrophy or muscle size. After that is muscular endurance. So this is how many repetitions you can typically do of a movement. So think of how many push-ups in a row you can do, uh, how many sit-ups in a minute you can do, things that are typically in like five to 50 repetition sort of range and it is often or it is almost always local muscle so what i mean by that is uh, it is i don't a push-up test is, is really how many reps that your triceps and pecs and, and deltoids can do it is not a cardiovascular endurance it is not a global physiological endurance it's specific to typically one or a few muscle groups at a time and this is why you have to do multiple tests for, for sort of every group there uh, after that, now we've moved into number seven, which is what I call anaerobic capacity. This is more synonymous with maximum heart rate. And now we're actually looking at rather than a single movement or muscle group, it is a total physiological uh, limitation. So it is uh, the maximum amount of work you can do in say 30 to 45 seconds, maybe even up to 120 seconds of all out work. Um, think of your classic interval type of stuff here. So how much work can you do uh, at a maximum rate where you're going to enter tremendous amounts of global fatigue? The next past that is maximal aerobic capacity. And this is probably something like in the eight to 15 minute range where you're going to reach probably both a maximum heart rate as well as a true VO2 max, which we'll, we'll talk a lot more about what that is uh, later. So that is, is uh, different from 
the previous one where it, you can't reach this in a matter of seconds. It simply takes multiple minutes to get to a position to where your VO2 max is actually going to be uh, sufficiently challenged. The last one, number nine, is what I call long duration. And this is just your ability to sustain sub-maximal work for a long period of time with no breaks, no reductions whatsoever. This is often called steady state training, or a lot of people just think of this when they think of cardio, but your ability to continue movement without any breaks or change or drop uh, is the last and final adaptation. So I noticed in your list of the nine different adaptations to exercise that you did not mention fat loss or health promoting benefits, which are two reasons that a lot of people exercise. Was there a specific reason that you did not mention those? Absolutely. It's because those things are actually not specific training styles. They are byproducts of these nine. So what I mean by that is if you understand how fat loss occurs, which we can certainly talk about, you'll realize some of these nine protocols are effective for fat loss and some are not. Uh, general health is the same thing. When we understand what it actually means to be healthy from a physiological perspective, then the rationale for what to train for is going to determine itself. So what I mean is looking at things like in order to be healthy, you have to have sufficient strength, you have to have cardiovascular fitness, you have to have sufficient muscle and etc. Therefore, training for one's health is determined by those restrictions. There are probably dozens or more tests that you can do for each one of those nine categories. And what I would actually like to do is walk you through my favorites for each and giving you both the scientific gold standard. So if you had the ability, unlimited resources, what should you go do? as well as some that are, are equipment-free, that are cost-free, things that anyone can do across the world. In addition to that, I wanna walk you through what those numbers should be, how do you identify if you're really poor in something or if you're great, and then if you aren't as good, maybe in a category and you wanna get better at it, exactly what to do in terms of protocols uh, for how to achieve optimal results in each of those steps. Another one that you can actually do is just a dead hang. So you can hold on to any bar, ideally one that is thin enough to where you can wrap your whole hand around it. So you don't want to be using a, a giant fat grip. Um, you're going to have a false reading here. So something like going to the gym and jumping on any pull-up bar or, or pull-up rack. And you want to hang. And this is a simple time test. So in general, we, we should be able to hang for a minimum of 30 seconds is what we're, what we're looking for. 30 to kind of 50 seconds is my like good, but we could probably get better here. If you're cruising above 60 seconds, I'm generally pretty happy. Um, a lot of the questions I get are based on false assumptions of what exercise can and can't do. As an example, we, uh, questions like momentum. Should I use momentum or, or that's cheating, right? Or it doesn't work, uh, it compromises my results. It's actually totally untrue. There are excellent reasons when you should use momentum when you lift. There are reasons when you should not. It is sometimes very beneficial to go fast with your exercise repetitions, sometimes very slow and controlled is better. You can do any number of tests here. A, a standard plank is a good testament of, the, of muscular endurance. So can you hold a front plank for 60 seconds? Can you hold a side plank for 45 seconds? Pretty easy. If you're able to do a push-up. So if you can't, that sort of tells you alone. It's actually interesting. If you can't do a single push-up, that's not a muscular endurance issue. That's actually now a strength issue because that's a one rep max problem. Um, so we want to be able to do for, again, for a general male, we should have no problem doing 25 plus consecutive push-ups. Can you get close to your predicted maximum heart rate? So the, the number we throw out is 220 minus your age. So if you're 50 years old, 220 minus 50, you should be able to get to a maximum heart rate of around 170 beats per minute. Now, that number is extremely generic. If you don't get there, that doesn't have any indication of your fitness. If you get higher, that doesn't mean you're any more fit. It's just a rough number. So here's what, I'm, what I want you to do. In this case, your heart rate recovery is the better metric. So I want you to get up to a maximum heart rate and then test your heart rate recovery. And what you should be looking for there is about half a beat uh, recovery per second. So you're gonna get up to a place where you reach like absolute terrible exhaustion, right? Maximum fatigue test your heart rate, and then count, right? Have a timer going. Within 60 seconds, you should have, again, that half a beat per second. You should have a heart rate recovery of 30 beats per minute. Within the next uh, the next minute, 
So two minute recovery, it should be again half that, so 60 beats. Those are rough numbers to go by. And your three minute recovery is again, half of that again. So that is the closest way. If your heart rate recovery is worse than that, then we know we have a problem in your anaerobic capacity or your cardiovascular capacity.